send to tell a lie. Millions of hearts have been broken, yes, yes. Yes, because these words were spoken. You know the words that were spoken? Here it is. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> yes, but if you break my heart, I'll break your joy and then I'll die. Be sure it's true when you say I love you. It's a sin a dog on this to tell a lie. What I say. KOI, Jack Williams speaking. Oh, finally. I've been getting a busy signal for an hour. It's Donna Jean Murkowski again. Hello, Donna Jean. I was hoping to hear from you. Are you still following the trial? Oh, my, yes. And I must say, you folks are doing a marvelous job with your radio skits. Although the gals in my Bible study group do have a few suggestions. <clears throat> do tell. First of all, we, uh, that is, I and my Bible study group, the Sonoran Sisters, we attend the trial together, don't you know? <laughs> we think it's important that your listening audience gets the unvarnished truth. Oh, that's what we're aiming for, Donna Jean, the truth. Uh, well, when you refer to Mrs. Judd as a tiger woman, it adds quite a bit of prejudicial shellac, don't you think? It's salacious. Well, by golly, I sure understand that, but we do have to keep the listeners engaged. And to that end, you could probably skip over some of the more mundane testimony. Did you have something in particular in mind? Well, just as a for instance, the landlord, Mr. Grimm, he droned on for nearly two hours about the luggage and which trunk measured how wide. I say skip all that and get to the juicy stuff. What, to your mind, is the juicy stuff? Her bandaged hand? We think it's a bullet wound. A bullet wound? Mm-hmm. It only makes sense that Winnie Ruth Judd got injured in the struggle. And if she did, how on God's green acre with an ocean view did she cut up a body with a bum hand? The truth will out, Donna Jean. We just need to be patient. <sighs> I suppose you're right. And by the way, we can't figure out why Mrs. Judd is only being tried for Miss Leroy's murder. Oh, Miss Samuelson is the prosecutor's insurance policy. What do you mean? If she's acquitted on this murder charge, they can try her all over again for the second murder. Oh, sweet baby Jesus, that is lower than a serpent's belly. Well, I'm sure it'll all come clear when we hear what Mrs. Judd has to say for herself. The sisters might have to start meeting twice a week. Oh, really? Well, you can't talk about eternity forever. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs> I wonder if we will hear from Winnie. I should tell my story to the jury. Um, that would be risky. I could say I wasn't home when the trunks were packed. Is that the truth? I wouldn't have any idea where to begin. Whose idea was it? I can't say. He needs my protection. Oh, for the love of... Ruth, if they find you guilty and sane, you'll hang. Who is this he? I have a pretty good idea who he is, but if I'm going to help you, I must have the truth. The truth? It's overrated. I always preferred a good story. Ruthie, you look lovely. Thank you, Jack. And that dress. <clears throat> now this gives me some ideas. I know it's your favorite, Jack. I wore it just for you. Baby, you smell like heaven. I feel like I'm in heaven when I'm in your arms. Let's sit down a while. Oh, Jack. I love you so very much. Yes. That's good. I don't know where this will lead us. Paradise, baby, straight to paradise. 
I couldn't do this sort of thing with someone I didn't love. Well, that's lucky for us, Ruthie. I love doing this sort of thing. Oh, Jack, I need to hear it first. I need to hear it from you. Doesn't that say it all? Yes, it does. Almost. I love you, Jack. I love you, Ruthie. <laughs> Indeed, I do. I love you very much. It's a sin. You're avoiding the question. I was stupid to believe him. For me, it was love. For him, it was transactional. I know that now. Nevertheless, I need to know what happened in the house that night. I don't like to think about it. I know. Just go slowly. You have to understand, I'd had several sleepless nights. I tried taking Luminol, but it, it didn't help me sleep. It does make the memory of the whole thing a little fuzzy. There was going to be a party at Sammy and Ann's house, and Jack Halloran wanted me to get some other girl, and we'd all go with him out to their house. So I suggested Mary Moore. She's a pretty little nurse, and who had been taking Salverson. Salverson? She has syphilis? Uh, no! Not now, anyhow, so I saw no harm. She's pretty and can be interesting. We went out to the house and a couple of Jack's friends were there. The girls didn't like it, so we left and went back to my place. It was a nice, clean evening. I truly didn't even take a drink. The next night, Anne wanted me to come over for bridge. So I took the streetcar to their house. It got to be late, so I decided to spend the night with Sammy and Anne. The next morning was when the quarrel began. They said they would tell Jack that I had introduced him to a nurse who had syphilis. Anne, you've got no right to tell him things from the office. She isn't contagious. The doctors let her work at nursing. I'll tell Jack. And he certainly won't think much of you for doing such a thing. If you do that, I'll tell Jack and everybody else that you two are perverts. <gasps> when I tell him that you introduce him to girls who have syphilis, he won't have a thing to do with you. Sammy, I'll shoot you if you tell him. Then Sammy ran out of the room and came back with a gun and said she would shoot me. And I threw my hand over the mouth of the gun and grabbed the bread knife. She shot me in the hand and I jumped on her with all my weight and knocked her down. Anne grabbed the ironing board and brained me with it. Some got the gun away from Sammy and, and shot her. Anne wouldn't stop attacking me. I shot her too. I'm so sorry Sammy shot me. Whether it was the pain or what, I killed them. There was no harm introducing this nurse, who's very pretty to the men. She was cured of her social disease. All right, people, look alive. We go on air in 90 seconds. Let's keep the energy up tonight. Treat it like Shakespeare. Gee, thanks. This time of night, KOY signal is reaching halfway around the globe. It's the biggest audience you'll ever have. We're picking it up with uh, Prosecutor Andrews' direct examination of the L.A. railroad worker, George Brooker. Make it sing in five, four, three. And now it's time for the trial of Winnie Ruth Judd. The prosecution's case is heating up. What gruesome evidence was revealed at the Los Angeles train depot? Let's listen in as the shocking details continue to unfold. Order in the court. You remember this lady very distinctly, don't you? Yes, sir. Tell me why. She had her hand bandaged up. Like she has now? Who? Her. The lady at the table? The lady with the bandaged hand? Yes. What? Her. How did you identify her in court? As the lady that claimed the trunks. The lady with the bandaged hand? The lady with the claim check. Who? Her. Would you recognize the lady with the claim check without the bandaged hand? If she's the one who claimed the trunks. Her. 
Who? The lady at the table. Yes. What? Yes. The lady with the bandaged hand. Who? What? I don't know. Third, Third base. Day. Move on, gentlemen. Sorry, Your Honor. The trunks arrived in Los Angeles on October 19th. Is that right? That's right. And what, if anything, attracted your attention to the trunks? I noticed an offensive odor coming from the large black trunk. Did you make an examination of the trunk at that time? I did. And what did your examination disclose? Blood leaking from one corner of it. What happened when the defendant arrived to claim the trunks? I asked who the trunks belonged to and she answered, To me. Ma'am, do you notice anything peculiar pertaining to these trunks? No, I can't say I do. Well, step a little closer and tell me if you smell a strong odor. I can't smell a thing. Are you sure? Oh, yes, now I can, but I can't imagine what's causing it. What does the trunk contain? Just personal effects and clothing. Now, what about this liquid dripping from the trunk? That's strange. Whatever could it be? You know, we've had quite a problem with poachers of late. This wouldn't be contraband deer meat, would it? <gasps> Heavens, no! We're going to need to open up the trunks and inspect the contents. Uh, of course, we must. Let me see. I must have them here. Oh, darn, I can't seem to locate the keys. I'll have to leave and return with my husband. He must have them. Did she ever return to claim the baggage? She did not. What did you do then? I notified the police department and asked them to send someone down to the station to open the trunks. What was disclosed to view when the trunk was opened? <laughs> what was revealed when the trunk was opened? Find out when we return following this commercial message. Are you tired of wasting money on moldy vegetables? Back so in 60 seconds, folks. Holy cow, you scared me to death. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to scream. I guess I just got caught up in the moment. It was perfect, Nancy. Just the sort of pizzazz we need. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Now we're coming into the last scene with the trunks and the second body, and we really need to drive home that image. <coughs> just like that. You heard right. Frozen food from Bird's Eye, available at all finer grocery stores. Now let's return to the testimony of the Los Angeles Station Master, as LA police are about to open the terrifying trunks, only to discover their salacious stuffing. The trunk contained the body of Agnes Ann Leroy in a state of advanced decomposition. And the other pieces of luggage? They contained the dismembered body of Hedvig Samuelson. Order! Order! Thank you, Mr. Brooker. That is all. Cross-examination. Cross-examination. Uh, nothing, Your Honor. Although we renew our objection as to the admissibility of the Samuelson evidence, Mrs. Judd is only being tried for the murder of Anne Leroy. The objection is overruled. Call your next witness. Prosecution calls R.R. Deputy Coroner for the City of Los Angeles. Mr. Creasy, you performed the autopsies on the bodies of Miss Hedvig Samuelson and Miss Anne Leroy, is that right? That I did. Could you describe the condition of the two bodies? Uh, the body of Miss Leroy was intact. What was the condition of Miss Samuelson? She had been disassembled. Can you be more specific? Certainly. Severed at the waist, neck, and knees. The parts were divided between two pieces of luggage. The head and legs were in the suitcase, and the torso was in the smaller trunk, along with books, letters, diplomas, a woman's purse, and a pair of ice skates. What did the woman's purse contain, if anything? 
Among other detritus were two empty shells of twenty-five caliber and one lead bullet. Were the contents of the luggage ruined with blood? Not as much as you might think. You see, the body was exsanguinated. Layman's terms, please. Drained of blood. Uh, bailiff, remove the young woman from the courtroom, please. Not surprising with a hemosectic body. Also, the knees were disarticulated. Without some skill, either as a doctor or as an operating room technician or as a butcher, it wouldn't be all that easy to do. Stay tuned for the stunning conclusion of tonight's episode, The Bloody Trunks of Terror. If you're like me, you're sick and tired of stripped screws. Okay, we're running a little long, people. Keep the drama, but step up the pace, please. Uh, let's lose the testimony from the ballistics expert and the police detective and uh, go straight to the housekeeper. No, 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 hold on, Jack. The detective was going to tell about the crime scene being contaminated. Can we dump the housekeeper instead? No! I've been working so hard on my accent. I used to work and clean house for them once a week. Ten seconds, Jack. Oh, hell's bells. Uh, page 56, everyone. The department store engineer. Shit! With the all-new Phillips screw and driver, available at all finer hardware stores. Welcome back to the trial that has a stranglehold on the nation with one hand and a bucket of blood in the other. We join the state's case in progress. Harriet, are you listening to the broadcast? Well, you best forget about the Lone Ranger and tune in KOY because the prosecution's case is wrapping up. Uh, yes, they just showed the confession letter that Plummer pulled out of the toilet. Passed it around the jury. Well, of course they cleaned it off first. I don't know, bleach or vinegar, most likely. Harriet, stay with me. Then their handwriting expert vouched for the authenticity of it, and they read the whole rambling mess into the record. No, it doesn't look good for our Winnie. Did you change the station? Well, do it now. The last witness is taking the stand. State your name, please. Mary Louise Moore. What is your occupation? I'm a registered nurse. Calling your attention to Thursday evening, the 15th day of last October, did you see the defendant on that evening? Mrs. Judd came to my home about 7 o'clock that evening and took me to her home. Who, if anybody, accompanied her at that time? Mr. Jack Halloran. <laughs> After the defendant, Mrs. Judd and Jack Halloran arrived at your home on that evening, where, if any place, did they go? We went to the home of Miss Samuelson and Miss Leroy. Now, Miss Moore, when you arrived at the house, did you or Mrs. Judd go inside? Neither of us went inside. We both stayed in the car. Tell me, Mary, what do you think of Jack? Well, he seems very nice. He's nicer than that. He is perfectly grand. You know, I used to live here with Anne and Sammy, but I moved away because of our differences about Jack. Anne is trying to take Jack away from me. I get so angry about Jack and Anne that I could either go crazy or die. Go crazy or die. That was during the time, as I understand, that Jack Halloran was inside the home? Yes. Did he return to the car? Yes, he returned to the car and brought two men with him. Uh, Dr. Brown and another man I didn't recognize. They all got in the car and we went over to Mrs. Judd's apartment. When I found out that Dr. Judd wasn't there, well, I asked them to take me home. Why did you ask to go home? My reputation. It was obvious these men had expectations. Shameful enough for Anne and Sammy, but Ruth is a married woman. Well, I had no desire to become someone's summer wife. 
Summer wife. Can you define that term for the court? No need to answer that question, Miss Moore. We all know the definition. Thank you. And you believe Mrs. Judd was a summer wife for Mr. Halloran? Uh, objection. I will allow it. The witness may answer. It pains me to say it, but yes. Ruth was head over heels and thought Mr. Halloran would leave his wife and kids for her. Please. He was a scoundrel, but still a practicing Catholic. Ruth was deluded and unbalanced. Uh, objection. And she certainly wasn't going to let Anne and Sammy stand in the way of her ridiculous fantasy. Oh, your honor. She was bound and determined to have Jack Halloran, no matter the cost. This witness has no expertise in psychiatry. Ugh. Mary Louise Moore, I'd wring your scrawny little neck if I wasn't afraid of getting syphilis! Order! I'll have order in my court! The prosecution rests its case. Your Honor, this is outrageous. You'll have your turn, Mr. Lukowitz. This court stands in recess. We'll reconvene tomorrow night on KOY. I mean tomorrow morning in the courtroom. Th that's right! The courtroom. Join us tomorrow night to find out what happens tomorrow morning in the trial of the century. Uh, Arizona versus the homicidal hellcat. The courthouse was a zoo. I could barely make it out the door, what with the reporters and the photographers and that horrible little man from the radio station. Hey! Tomorrow, it'll be my turn to testify. You can't take the stand, Ruth. We must stick with the insanity plea. But I'm not insane. I didn't want to kill them. It was self-defense. I understand. But with all these gruesome details coming out, the jury is against you. A dismembered body doesn't sit well with these farmers. I told you, what happened to Sammy wasn't my idea. Oh, for the love of... Ruth, if they find you guilty and sane... You'll hang. Heck of a broadcast last night, Jack. Ad sales are through the roof. Oh, it's history making, all right, in more ways than one. But I suppose this gravy train is running out of track. Yep, the trial should wrap up in another day or two. Too bad we don't have a double murder every week. Now, Fred. Uh, all I meant to say is, what a ride. Wait until you hear what's on deck for tonight's broadcast. <laughs> Jumping jackpot, it's radio gold. Let's have a look. Oh, just when I thought this trial couldn't get any more licentious. Uh, really, really salacious. We don't have much time. Uh, Stu, is the cast standing by? That's a big okie dokie, JW. Whoa, hold on a minute. We can't put this on the air. We run a family operation here. Well, Mr. What's Palmer, he talking about? I, I just wrote down what they said. What am I looking for? Just because it's true doesn't make it appropriate. Oh, brother. So we'll run a disclaimer. What the hell's a disclaimer? Uh, I see a circus motif. We'll have to hit it on the fly, Fred. I mean, we're on in five, four, three. What a lonely world would be without them. It isn't the song words, the song that they sing. It isn't the sunshine that makes you like rain. So what is this magic that makes all the things?